Well, hi folks, this is Darren with My RV Works, and today we're going to be doing a deep dive into the suburban water heater. Um, not only are we going to be doing a deep dive, the plan is to slice these open and see what's on the inside, so stay tuned for that. But um, both of these water heaters have failed. They're roasted. They're, the, the tanks have rusted out, and that's why I ended up with them. We were going to throw them away or bring them to the scrapyard and scrap them out, but I figured we could add value by slicing them open and taking them apart. This one's a six gallon, this one's a 12 gallon. Now on my website, we're gonna make a link below on the website, but if you go to the MyRVWorks.com website, you click on the resources tab, uh, work your way down to the online manuals, and um, and, then, and then that's gonna dump you into like a, a page where you have to sort. So you're gonna sort by water heater and then suburban, but they're gonna get this little sheet here uh, it's one of the documents. I, I went directly where I'm telling you to go, and it's going to tell you your suburban water heater identification. So it's going to give you your part numbers, okay, and then the different types of models they have and the serial numbers, okay. So um, all suburban water heaters are going to start off with SW for suburban water heater. A suburban furnace is going to start off with SF for suburban furnace. So really, really simple that way. And then on the water heater, the next number is going to tell you the volume. This one's going to be an SW12. This will be an SW6. 12 gallons, 6 gallons, and then it goes on if it's got motor aid or whatnot. Um, the serial number on the, your unit, it's going to have um, a serial number. The first digit of your serial number is the year that that water heater was manufactured. Um, the, the first two digits are the year that it was manufactured. The second two digits are the week of that year that it was manufactured. And then the last sequence of digits is going to be which, you know, um, the, the number of the week. Okay, so First two digits is year, second two digits is week of the year, and then the, the balance of those numbers is the number that they made. So those are some good things that might help you. Now, if you need to get parts for your suburban water heater, it's gonna be very good for you to know your model number and your serial number, so when you go to the parts counter, that's what they need to know to look these things up. I've mentioned in some of my other videos that um, the, the part number might remain the same, and they might make a change on something, and uh, but it, it's reflected in the serial number. So you need your model number and your serial number if you're going to go to the parts counter and get a part. Okay, so I wanted to start off by talking about that. This is right off my website. You can get it off the Suburban website. I'm sure I'm not the only website that has this, but that's where we have it for you. Also, another document that I have on our website is all the part numbers for, for parts. Okay, so if you look here now, this document, it's Suburban part numbers, but it's their furnaces and their water heaters. So this starts on page six to nine. So I just printed out six to nine for this part. And um, so here you, you can see, here you have your parts, here's your part number, okay? And um, you might see uh, on some of these things, they, they do talk a little bit about, you know, six after serial number, after serial number. So that's why I was saying you need your serial number also to, to know what part. And so it's not enough to know the model number, you need to know your model number and your serial number. And so we, it's four pages of all the parts that you might need for your water heater. So that's a resource we have for you on our website, myrvyworks.com, resources tab, and then sort for water heater and suburban. So I wanted to cover that real quick, get some paperwork out of the way. Um, so I'm gonna set this right here, put some gloves on. So here we have suburban water heaters, okay? And um, the suburban water heater is in a metal tank with a porcelain coating on the inside, okay? So since it's a metal tank, it's gonna rust, right? So they put that porcelain on the inside of it, kind of like, the, the way I think of it is, is um, there, there's a restaurant, when we lived in Texas, we used to go there all the time. It was in um, Dakota, what was the name of that city right there by Oklahoma? It, oh, drawing a blank, uh, big oil rush place. Uh, you got Wichita Falls, then Burke Burnett, that's what it was called. So Burke Burnett had this restaurant, I don't remember the name of it, but they used to serve chicken fried steak and all this yummy stuff, but their plates were like the metal plates with that little porcelain coating with all the, it, it, like so farmy, I loved it. And their food was fantastic there. And so that's what's kind of going on inside of these tanks is you've got this metal tank with the porcelain coating on the inside. Um, now the important thing about the tanks is because they're metal and they rust, well, what we're going to do to prevent the rust is we're going to use an anode rod. Okay, so this is an anode rod. The part you see on the body or tank is just this part right here, okay? This little welding nipple is the other end. You'll see it coming out here. Um, you'll see that little piece. Now here's one that is relatively new. This one's, you can see it starting to pit. Dakota, can you see that? Dakota's my camera guy. Can you see that really good? 
the pitting? Is it focusing and all that? Yeah. We're good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You can zoom back out. So, um, these, it's like a Jesus rod. It's going to sacrifice itself so that you have hot water. Um, so this is it new. This is hardly used. I would still use this one. And, um, but we've pulled these out of water heaters where it's just a stick sticking out, like a corn dog stick sticking out. And then we've even pulled them out of water heaters where the stick has even be, been rusted out. Okay. And then we've even done them where there's just the plug. It's starting to eat. And the reason we get called in to do that is because the water heater's got issues. So one of the things you're supposed to do every year is inspect your anode rod. Now, when you inspect your anode rod on these, the anode rod is in the bottom down here, okay? Or down here, it's accessible from the front. The anode rod doubles as a drain plug. So every year you're gonna pull the anode rod out, you're going to inspect it. If it's 75% or more depleted, you're going to replace it. They're under 20 bucks. Uh, they have magnesium and zinc. Um, and um, how do you know which one to use? Well, that's a function of the water in the area that you're using your water in. Um, this is the same concept they have in residential water heaters. Residential water heaters is also a steel tank with the porcelain lining, overwhelmingly. Um, but their anode rods are like a lot bigger than this, and they last like a lot longer than these do. Um, perhaps in their infinite wisdom of designing these things, they want you to back flush your water heater every year at a minimum and then inspect this. So they make them so that they can be depleted. What causes a water heater to rust if the anode rod's in it? Well, the anode rod's gonna get consumed. That's what it does. That's, that's its purpose in life is to basically be consumed. And if you do not replace your anode rod, and if you don't back flush your water heater, now what I mean by back flush, I've got another video, several videos on back flushing water heaters. And I use the term back flush, it's my own term, but I wanna contrast the difference between draining your water heater and back flushing your water heater. Draining your water heater is just opening up um, this port, the drain port, this is true of your Dometic Atwood water heaters and also your suburban water heaters. Um, take out your drain plug, lift up your pop-off valve, let some air get in it, and you're gonna let that drain, that's draining. You haven't gotten the sediment out. You may have gotten a little bit, but below, and we're gonna see, when we slice these water heaters open, we're gonna see, I'm expecting, some sediment on the bottom. When, where does the sediment come from? Well, it might be the anode rod, it just might be crap you're getting coming in from whatever you're connected to. We stayed at an RV park and they had problems with their water main. It was cold, it was winter, and they kept breaking water lines. And so they were always cutting them open and fixing them and mending them, just kind of a scab type job, and then they'd break again, then they'd break again. So the water that we were getting into our RV was always muddy and brackish because all that muddy water was getting in. We didn't stay at the water at the RV park very long because it was just ridiculous. But all that crap is accumulated and getting into your water system in your RV. Um, so all that's going to settle down here at the bottom. And so if you don't actively back flush, to go to run to the service trailer and get that yellow back flush one, it's in drawer two, and also the copper one that we made. So Dakota's gonna run and get the wand that we use to back flush these things. Back flushing is a very active process where draining is an, a passive process where you're just gonna let that water drain right on out. Um, back flushing is an active process. You're gonna need a garden hose and a wand and you're gonna get in there and you're gonna really go to town trying to spray all that stuff out. And it's always exciting when I do that for a customer because they had no idea that that was even in their water heater. So we're spraying the stuff and all this white chunky calcium buildup is pouring out of the water here and they're just freaking out. If you do not do that to your water heater on a minimum annual basis, but if you are full timing in your RV, I would recommend doing it every six months. It's a simple procedure and it's only gonna, it's like a pay me now, pay me later type of a proposition. Um, on that note, we did a water heater where, um, here we go. All right, buddy, thanks, man. Okay, so uh, Dakota went to get the ones we use on our, uh, our our everyday carry, <laughs> right? So uh, let's talk about this one first. This I you could get these at camping stores, WalMarts, whatever. They're just really cheap. And um, but if you're only going to back flush your water heater once a year, it, it totally does the purpose just fine. And what you do with this, you connect your garden hose to it, and then you basically stick it here in your drain port, and you just kind of work it around and spray all the chunky stuff out. Okay. Um, I stopped using this. You can see it's been a lot used a lot. 
but it starts to fatigue after a while. And so I just took some uh, 3 eighths, what is that, 3 eighths, 3 eighths copper and put a little crook in the end of it and then got a little valve that's a little bit more, you know, professional. And um, I use this kind. But uh, what I'll do is I'll make a link below the, down in the description. We'll have quite a few links for you down there. Um, I've seen some on Amazon. I think it's like a Chrome piece, whatever. So um, I think like 10 bucks. So I'll just make a link down there. So if you are living in your RV uh, full time, then I would, Darren's recommendation is to back flush your water heater every six months and check your anode rod if you have a Suburban. On that note, if you have an Atwood slash Dometic water heater, you do not need an anode rod. Those are aluminum tanks and they don't have the same problem of rusting. In fact, they don't rust. <laughs> um, they can rupture if you freeze them and most of the an uh, Atwood tanks that we replace are because of freezing and they rupture. We do replace a fair amount of Suburbans because they have the one with rusting. Because like we said, it's a steel tank with a porcelain lining. So when you're back flushing your um, Suburbans every six months to a year, you're also checking your anode rods. Okay, so there we go. Now, um, what can we say about this? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this little... Yeah, I'm going to move this big 12-gallon off to the side, and we're going to do our little show-and-tell on the 6-gallon. They're pretty much the same, but it's just going to be a little bit easier to hump around. So I'm going to take this guy and put him down here. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is let me give you a little bit of a show and tell with this water heater before we slice it open. And um, what you're going to see is you're going to see the front. You're not going to see the backside because it's in your RV. Um, so we have to follow the trail, right? So we could follow the trail. We could follow the gas trail. We could follow the 12 volt trail, the 120 volt trail, or the water trail. Okay, so we're going to follow all those trails. Let's start with the water trail. Okay, we're going to tell the water trail through its story and we're going to go on that way because Aaron likes to follow trails. So on the back is where your water is going to connect. Cold water comes in on the bottom. It comes out on the top as hot water. Sometimes, most of the times, you're going to have a bypass option on your water heater. Some of the suburban water heaters have a thing called a motor aid. The motor aid is going to have two little bullhorns sticking out of this thing with, that are also aluminum. So that makes a third way to heat your water. One way to heat your water is with an electric heating element. Another way to heat your water is with a flame from LP. And another way to heat your water is with the, um, the motor aid, okay? Certainly not as efficient as a gas, but it's another way to heat your water. So on the back, cold comes in, hot comes out. Some of you might notice a check valve. The reason I'm gonna mention the check valve here on the hot is for several reasons. One, reason to put a check valve on your hot supplying out your, your return feed of hot water coming out is if you're doing a military shower because you're boondocking and you want to save your hot water and you turn off you, you turn it on to get wet turn it off to lather up turn it on to get wet again if there's a check valve right here then all your hot water stays in the line and doesn't drain itself back into the tank so that's one benefit of a check valve another benefit of a check valve well, that's the biggest benefit of a check valve because you don't have to run your water all the way on a note there, you might want to put a check valve closer to your shower head so that that hot water stays there also, but that's a whole other topic. Some of you are going to have a bypass valve here um, where you'll have a little valve here to turn off the cold supply, a valve here to turn off the hot return, and then you'll have a valve connecting the two. Okay, So if you turn off the cold, you turn off the hot, you open the one in the middle, therefore bypassing the water heater. Why would you do that? You would do that if you were going to winterize your RV. You would do that if you're going to service your RV. Okay. Um, some of the RVs, their bypass is not done in the back. It's done on a lever somewhere. Um, mileage may vary. But anyway, the point I wanted to say is that we're going to start with our story. We're following our water. Water cold's going to come in and water hot's going to come out. When we slice these open, you'll see this little, I believe, you're going to see this little J-hooky thing in here to suck it from the top. So water comes in, right? Now, the water, the water is to, is to become heated. Um, that's why it is a water heater, not a hot water heater. If it was a hot water heater, and a lot of you guys are calling these hot water heaters, it's not grammatically correct to call this thing a hot water heater. It is a water heater, okay? Um, because if it was a hot water heater, then the water is already hot. It's a cold water heater. So let's just call it a water heater. Water heater, water heater, water heater, not a hot water heater. Um, we, now we understand that. 
So water's gonna fill our tank. We know that we have our fill port down below. This piece up here is a pop-off valve. If the water gets over 150 degrees or no, 150 pounds of pressure or 210 degrees, then this thing is gonna start weeping and leaking out. Occasional weep, occasional uh, leaking. I mean, that's totally acceptable. That's not a problem if it does that. Um, inside of here, you have a pillow of air on the top of your tank. And if you, you're, through doing life and using your RV, you're going to lose that pillow of air and the thing will become waterlogged and it starts to build up pressure, it burps itself out and everything's fine. That's what it's there for. But if you have this little pillow of air, then um, your water heater is going to cycle a little bit better. It does need a little, little pillow of air there. If you find that this thing's leaking a lot and it's not from, uh, it, it's still good, you back flush your water heater, you got all the sediment out, because a lot of times these pop-off valves, um, hold on, stay right there. This right here is what I'm talking about with the pop-off valve. It lifts up a little lever, spring-loaded handle. You can see inside of here that um, a lot of times, see that's supposed to be like moving around like it's supposed to. A lot of times these will seize themselves. Why would it seize itself? Because you didn't back flush your water heater. You didn't back flush your water heater. Don't like calcium and craps floating around inside of here and faults this out. Inside of here you have a spring that is metal on metal and it could get uh, filled in with some nasty stuff and cause this to leak. But let's say, let me go back to my back corner here. Let's say that you know your pop-off valve is good. Let's say that you know that everything is good. Uh, let's say that you have a 40 PSI regulator on your hose and everything's fine and you're still weeping. At that point, I would say, let's get a accumulation tank over here to help take up some of that pressure. Okay. So pop off valve here. Let's talk real quick about burping your water heater because we're talking about the pop off valve. If you're going to what we call burp your water heater or reestablish that pillow of air, then what we're going to do is we're going to turn off our water supply to our RV. We're going to uh, turn off our water heater. We're going to open up a cold water valve, and then we're going to lift up on our lever, and water's going to spark coming out of here until it stops. It might even go glug, 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 bleh. That's why they call burping it, okay? And so what you're doing is you're letting air coming back into the top of the tank. By having your cold water valve open, you're letting air into the line so it's not like an upside down milk jug, glug, glug, glug. You're letting air through, pushing the air out, recreating that, that pillow of air inside of the top of your water heater, and once it's done, close the lever, turn on your water heater, turn on your water, you're good to go. Um, when we were in, because we full-time RV'd for about 15 years, and we've been all over the country, um, and there were some places where we had to burp it more frequently than others. I don't remember what state we were in when we did that. We've been to almost every state. I want to say Kentucky <laughs> in the summertime. So um, anyway, um, beautiful, by the way. So uh, that's the story with the pop-off valve. The rest of the stuff, we're going to come in on following the trail when we talk about the ACDC side. So on the following the trail of the water, cold's coming in. It goes into here. Hot comes out. We talked about your bypass valve. We talked about the check valve. We talked about the pop-off valve. Okay. And um, we talked about draining it and back flushing it in the different ones. Great. Let's follow the trail of DC. Now we're going to follow the DC trail. Okay, so we're done following the water trail. If I think of something else, I'll throw it in there, but we're going to follow the trail of DC. DC voltage. Okay, water heater is dead in the water until it gets a signal coming in on. Hold on. You flip your switch. Okay, so basically that's the point I'm trying to make. So you're going to have a switch. Um, here, there's, well, it's a switch on the inside that you're gonna flip to turn on your water heater. So on one side of the switch, 12 volts is just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. You flip the switch, the 12 volts passes through the switch and then it works its way down here, okay? Um, you need 12 volts on, what is it, the red wire? Yeah, you need 12 volts on this red wire right here, okay? So when you have 12 volts on the red wire, 12 volts DC coming into this, it's gonna feed a control board. Let me show you the control board. I'll come back around here. You're going to find this little manila looking card deck looking thing. Okay. Sometimes they'll stick them here on the side, somewhere on your water heater. Sometimes they're on a bulkhead wall. They're pretty close. The distance that it can travel is, is determined by the length of this electrode wire and this wire harness. 
So the beautiful thing about this is it's out of the elements. Let's compare contrast the Suburban DSi. Why do I call it a DSi board? Direct Spark Ignition, DSi. If you do not have a DSi board, then you are going to have a gas valve here that you, human, have to come out here with a lighter and light. That is not direct spark ignition. That is like you lighting at ignition. So the DSi board, on the Suburban DSi board, it's not mounted in the front. It's inside the coach somewhere. On your Atwood Dometic water heaters, your DSi board is going to be mounted in the front. Now, that thing is potted, um, which means it's got this epoxy resin on it. I don't... Go grab a DSi board, a Nat one. Um, just one, just one. Here, one, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. There we go. Um, so these would be your Atwood Dometic DSi boards. These would be mounted on the front of the water heater on the outside, okay? Um, the Suburbans are mounted inside your RV space, okay? So we're going to come back to that in a minute. Um, so you need to verify you have 12 volts on your red wire. If you have 12 volts on your red wire, great. That means that you've made your signal from your switch. Okay, you flip your switch on the inside. Do I have 12 volts on my red wire? Yes, lovely. I've made it through my switch all the way to the DSi board. When I do that, I should get power coming out on my brown wire, which is going to energize my redundant solenoids. Okay, um, this is where those part number sheets come in handy. These are suburban solenoids, okay? Um, White Rogers uh, 161109. It's got the Suburban part number on it. Um, I've seen these on Amazon. I'll make a link down below. Uh, several people have reached out to us asking where do we get these solenoids from. And uh, so we've got solenoids for the Suburban and also for the Atwood slash Dometic. Um, actually, I might make links to both of those because if you're watching this video, you might need help on both water heaters. So the brown wires feed these. Below you that you can't see, I've got a table with a bunch of pieces parts. I think what I'm going to do after I slice these open, I might do either another video where we're going to talk about all these different components and we'll do how to test them. Okay, so look for that. Power comes in on my red wire. Yellow wire is ground. Brown wire goes to my fuel solenoids. Blue wire turns on the light on the inside telling you that it's tried and it can't, and therefore it turns the light on telling you that it wasn't able to, to ignite or it extinguished itself. So you have four wires. Power comes in on red. Yellow is ground. Blue turns the light on inside. Brown turns on my fuel solenoid. Also out of my DSi board is this igniter. So when I energize my brown wire to open up my gas valve, I'm also sending a spark down my larger electrode, which is like striking an arc on my igniter down in here. So gas is introduced into the burn chamber. The arc is struck. Boom. We have ignition. So how does it know to keep the gas valve open? Um, you have an igniter like this. Okay. Is that in focus, Dakota? See it pretty good? Okay, um, now I rotated this. This guy fits right in there. Um, and then this electrode wire is connected to it. This then communicates to the DSi board. Okay, so one end of my wire is connected to my electrode and the other end of my wire, well, here it is connected to the electrode. So therefore, this end is connected to my DSi board, okay? So I energize my brown wire here. That opens my gas solenoid. At the same time, I'm striking an arc. And that's what I was going to show you. On this electrode, you want about an eighth of an inch gap. The distance of the gap is an eighth of an inch, and it's a function of the thickness of the element of, of this electrode. So if we had a larger electrode, we want a larger gap, smaller electrode, smaller gap. But the diameter of these is pretty much standard in the RV industry, therefore eighth of an inch. So this top conductor is bonded to ground and then my electrode is connected right here. And there's a gap right there. Okay, see the gap? 
So what's happening is it's, it, it's a, a current rectification. It's 0.3 microamps flowing through this wire. And it jumps the gap because it's in the flame and there's carbon in the flame and it's using the carbon as a current carrying conductor through the carbon. As long as I have a flame, I have carbon. As long as I have carbon, I can jump my gap. Okay? Um, to ground. That is how the board knows to keep the flame on. That, or more specifically, that's how the board knows to keep the uh, fuel solenoid open. Okay? Now, there is one stop along the way that it goes. And that is through the thermostat. Okay? The thermostat, uh, there are two. This one is 12 volts. Uh, you have a thermostat. There's two thermostats here. Um, one of them is for 12 volts. One of them is 120 volts. So since we're telling the story of the 12 volt path, we're going to take the 120 volt one and put him back down, and we're going to talk about the 12 volt one. Okay? So this bottom circuit, so I'm going to connect a wire to this point and this point. Both of these thermostats need to be closed in order for me to send power over to my um, fuel solenoid. Okay, so I come in here. This one is set to 140 degrees. So if I'm less than 140 degrees, it's closed. As soon as I get to 140, it opens. Therefore, my circuit is open. But if I'm less than 140 degrees, I'm going to pass my 12 volts through to the other side. And this is what I'm talking about. In my, in the, I'll do a whole other video. I think this one's going to go a little bit too much detail, but I think on my next video, I'll actually break out the meter and we'll actually pass current through these things and we'll also heat them up and see where they trip. So we're going to make a whole other video after this one. We're going to wrap this video up when we're done and then we'll do another video where I'm going to put this on like maybe a cast iron pot with a little heat underneath it and we'll trip these out. So 12 volts is, enters the circuit here. I'm less than 140 degrees, therefore I pass through and then they have a wire bonded to this side. And I need to go through this one back to this pin to go back to do work. This ECO, energy cutout, emergency cutoff is what we say in the trades, but ECO, energy cutout is the technical word. It trips at 180 degrees. Okay, It does have a reset. The regular thermostat down below does not have a reset. There we go. One thing I want to point out on the differences between the DC and the AC thermostats. They are not interchangeable. Okay. Even though they're both set to 140 and 180 and they both have resets, I want you to look. One of these, the tabs is a little fatter. Skinny tab, fat tab. Skinny tab, fat tab. Also, the wires on this one come in from the this side and the wires on this one come in from this side. Um, so that is to say, I need it in my water heater in this orientation not in this orientation. In this orientation, you see I'm, I'm budding. This guy, we have our wires coming in from the side. So you do need to have a DC thermostat and an AC thermostat. Even though they look the same, their prongs are wider and they come in from the opposite side. Okay, so this was our DC one. 140 degrees is your water temperature. On, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. If I'm less than, I'm going to turn on. I believe 115 is where it kicks back on again. So it gets to 114, 140, and I think 115 is the number. Turns back on again, 140, 115, 140, 115. If this thermostat fails, and they do fail, then this guy is going to trip at 180 degrees, and that means he's going to trip out. Now, you can reset this guy, okay? Um, but this whole thing is one part, okay? So enough on the DC thermostat. So we followed our trail for water. We've now followed our trail for DC. It comes in from the switch. It comes through our red wire to our DSI board on the red wire. Yellow wire is ground. Blue wire goes back up to the switch to turn the light on, leaving with the brown wire and our electrode wire. Okay. Uh, the electrode wire comes down here to our igniter. We talked about the gap and how that knows to rectify its uh, signal of 0.3 microamps. And here we have our brown wire coming over here to energize our redundant solenoids. We showed you the solenoids in the next video we're going to do. We're actually going to have a uh, we're going to energize a solenoid. That's going to, you're going to see it suck a screwdriver in. We're going to how does a solenoid work? We're going to get into that in our next video. Um, the solenoids are redundant, but we're going to talk about that on the on the when we follow the trail of, of the LP side. Okay, so we follow the trail on water. We're done with that. We follow the trail on DC. I'm not going to add much more to that. Let's follow the trail on AC. Then we'll follow the trail on um, 
gas, and then we'll cut it open. Uh, so if you're AC, here we have a junction box. From your breaker box, you're gonna have a piece of Romex wire that feeds into this port right here. Now, some of you may have a convenience receptacle in your RV, and it might look like a light switch. So, it, so Romex is gonna come through here, whether it comes directly from the breaker panel or where it comes through the breaker panel to the convenience switch, which will look like a light switch, and then down to here. If you don't have the convenience receptacle, or if you don't have the convenience switch, then you could turn your breaker on and off as your switch, as a worst case. Um, so it comes in here, and then follow the circuit through here. It's gonna come down to the very bottom, down here. Uh... Okay, so what Dakota's doing is he's doing a close-up shot of that um, power switch. And what we're talking about is this switch down here, okay? Uh, so 120 volts comes in. Okay, pan out a little bit, buddy. Okay, so 120 volts comes in here, and it's gonna go right down to that switch, okay? So there's my switch. Okay, after I leave my switch, I'm gonna come up here to my, where is it? To my um, thermostat with the smaller prongs. He's gonna live on this side, on, the, on this half of my cover. Um, just like our DC, we're gonna come in on one, go through our 140 degree thermostat, come out through our 180 degree thermostat, and then after I leave this, I immediately come back down to my heating element. Okay, this is the heating element that is actually inside your water heater. Okay, so the AC path is kind of simple. It leaves your breaker box. I have never, I'm, I don't, I don't want to say it's a de fact thing, but these things consume about 10 amps and they're always their own breaker. They're always their own breaker. I've never seen the water heater shared with something else. Doesn't mean that it, 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 it's never gonna happen, but it leaves a breaker box, may or may not go through a switch on the inside, comes through this junction box, goes down to the switch, which is an on-off switch, then it comes through the thermostat, and then it lands on my uh, um, heating element. And this is one of the things we're gonna do on that other video. We're gonna show you how to test these things with Ohm's law, Watt's law, and all that kind of stuff, okay? Um, so we, and, and there we go. We follow the trail to, of the 120 volts. So we follow the trail for water. We follow the trail for DC. We follow the trail for AC. Let's follow the trail for gas. Gas is going to come in through here. We want 11 inches of water column. Okay. It says it on the sticker right over here, manifold pressure, which is 0.6 ounces. We're going to come through into here. We're going to connect with a three eighths flare. Okay. Um, we're going to go through our gas valve. The gas valve has redundant solenoids. If you're going to replace one solenoid, you're going to replace a second one. If you're going to replace one, you're going to replace them both. Okay. Um, we're going to come through our solenoid. Gas is going to flow through here, through a small orifice. Okay. So you see this valve that I'm pointing to right here? This, you might need to take this apart. Sometimes insects will make a nest inside of this brass valve right here. So you have to take off your burn tube, which we call the J-tube. Disassemble this, and you might find some insects have made a nest inside of there. Okay? Um, that is also true on your Dometic Atwood water heaters. And on those water heaters, you have two different size orifices for a 6-gallon or a 10-gallon. So if you have an Atwood Dometic water heater and you need to replace your orifice, note that there are two different part numbers for the two different sizes. Okay? Um, and then... The LP gas flows through, it picks up some air down in here, and it goes into the burn chamber and creates ignition. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to slice these open here in the next little bit, and you're going to see this, this tube thing that's like a dead-end tunnel where flame goes in and comes back out, okay? So, and I think we're almost ready to do that. Y'all want to see me slice this open like a Gallagher with a sledgehammer? So, um, uh, now, another thing on the gas is there's this little gland thing. Uh, it's going to go right in there because we do have a flame. Now, the byproduct of propane is going to be water and carbon dioxide, but if it's not burning properly and, and the, it's, it's burning dirty, it might create carbon monoxide, which is a poisonous gas. And so we always want to block off, whether it's your furnace, your water heater, your refrigerator, uh, you want to block off the outside combustion area from the inside part. Okay? Um... With that, what we're going to do now is we're going to slice these open. So basically, I'm done talking about the different paths 
water, DC, AC, and gas. And at this point, I think what we'll do is we'll slice these open. Uh, to, to compare contrast, let me poop, poop. Six gallon over here, I'll throw the 12 gallon up. And um, it's basically the same thing, just a bigger, bigger surface because it's a bigger tank, okay? And um, I think we'll cut them both open and you can see the differences between the two because they're both rusted. And I think what would be really exciting is to see the um, where it rusted from. And um, I don't know that I mentioned this, so let me talk about the rusting for a second. We started talking a little bit about it. So follow with me on this. Sediment in your water heater because it wasn't back flushed and wasn't serviced like it's supposed to be. Sediment builds up. It creates a hot spot down there, okay? That sediment gets in there and starts to eat away at the porcelain and that's where your tanks are going to fail, right in that spot. So now that I've made that statement, let's I'm gonna totally change over and put on protective gear and take a grinder and cut these open. But uh, I think that's what we're gonna find when we get into this slicing and dicing part. Okay, um, is it is it rusting at the bottom? But we'll find out. Now let me do share this with you before we slice them open. Uh, here we do see some rust, and let's stand up the six gallon on end. Yeah, he's really rusty down here. Yeah, water's coming out. So this will be an exciting one. We'll start with the six the six gallon one first, and here's the bottom of his. Uh, Dang, he's been he's been leaking for a long time down there. Um, so this should be exciting. I'm looking forward to it. We'll start cutting open the six gallon first. It's just less to cut. And then we'll cut this guy open. So we're going to pause, get changed over. We'll have face shields on and earplugs and all that kind of stuff. And I'm just going to use my grinder to slice it open. All right. So we'll be back in a moment. All right. So I'm suited up. I got my visor, earplugs, gloves thing. We've made a line around it. So this is where we've decided to cut through. So um, I'm going to put earplugs in. Okay, every time I put earplugs in, I can't help but remember the uh, firing lines. Quantico seems to come to mind. They've got all these big shooting fields you run down the tunnels, but you always put the earplugs in. Um, uh, that and Listerine. There's, I'm sure any Marines out there, there's a certain smell that you smell. Kiwi shoe polish. Uh, just Anyway, for me, it's earplugs. Here we go. Okay. So, uh, let me get out of some of this and we'll take a look inside. Okay, so we've got these open and what I've done is I've placed them the way they would be. So here I'm going handheld. Okay, that little white tube is the cold water coming in and then there's a, the hot water going out. So let's get you closer into that. So there you can see where the cold water comes in. You see a couple rust spots along there. And then if we pan up, it draws the hot water off the top. And then that little buffer between the top of the tank and here, there's your little pillow of air that it's looking for, okay? And um, I was expecting to see more rust on the bottom, but we've got it all along that back seam there, okay? But you can also see that little blue porcelain uh, lining. It's got a little bit of a sheen to it here. Um, and that's that blue porcelain that they paint the tanks with to help aid in preventing them from rusting. Okay, now over on this side, okay, here we have some of that sediment that you're trying to get out. That little spot down here on the bottom, that's where your drain plug would be. And so a lot of those little chunky things like barnacles, um, let me do it this way. Okay, there you go. Uh, that's all settling in the bottom of the tank. Here coming at us is the heating element. Okay, and up on top, we have the pop-off valve pressure and temperature relief valve. We call it the pop-off valve. And so you can see if sediment is floating around here, I got a shadow. Hold on. Let me go like this. Let me just do it this way. There we go. Oh, nice shot. Okay. So here we have 
any sediment is going to work its way inside of that pop-off valve. So here we have rust all along the top. Okay, and then we have this long burn tube, is what I'm going to call it. That's where your flame is taking place. Now, I think what would be fun is to slice that in half as well. So I think the next thing I'll do is I'll cut that in half and we'll take a look at that. Um, and so here we have, get my light shining in there, right? The inside of the suburban water heater. And so since I got my grinder going, I'm going to go ahead and cut this, this long tube right here, cut it in half. And uh, what we're going to see is halfway down, it's basically um, a, f a flat stock welded in the middle, but then in the very back of this here, it's open so it can come in the bottom and flow out the top. So let's slice that in half and then we'll, um, we'll cut open the 12 gallon and I'm sure we're gonna find the same thing. But I guess the takeaway, turn my flashlight back on, is one of these points here was rusting. All it takes is one and you have a rusted through tank. Okay, now this was a smaller six gallon, and um, but all it takes is one spot and it'll weep, 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 drip, drip, drip. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut this guy, cut that open, and, and just see what's in with that. All right, here we go. All right, as promised, we have sliced open the burner head, and so inside there. Um, let me set this down and get a flashlight on some stuff here. So that's just where the flame makes a U-turn. And what I mean by that is in here, that's where the flame comes out and you see the electrode right there. So this whole chamber here is filled with fire and it comes to the end, makes a U-turn and then exhausts out to the, um, they've got a little deflector shield on the end of the chimney. Now I'll show you this. So you see how much of, I'm going to call that the U-turn. Um, so the flame comes up on this side, makes a U-turn in this part here, and then goes back down the other side. And So when you're going to do an annual cleaning on your water heater, you're certainly not going to cut it in half, but you might take, um, like a, I take a little long chimney brush looking deal, and I'll scrub the this plate here, because this plate is the part that's facing down. All right. Now... Another thing I was doing while I was in there is I sliced open the electric heating element, okay? And you'll see that that's basically just a, a winding spring, and it looks like they have some kind of a, um, I don't know, heat transfer or something on the outside tube. And I also even sliced open the tip, and there's your spring. So that's the part that is glowing red hot, okay? These are 1,400-watt heating elements, and so I basically cut it in half and then snipped off the top of it to show the inside of the heating element. So when you're reading your ohms resistance, that should be about 10 ohms, um, you're reading that wire, the wire, the spring wire. Okay, so what do we have next door here? So I went ahead and took the time to cut this one open. Here, you've got a little bit of a better view of the uh, that blue, um, like I was saying, you, you see this on some of these old... Um, you know, um, plates and things, but uh, maybe we could turn this into an old plate or a planter pot or something. But this would be where the cold's coming in, and up here we have where the hot goes out, and the distance between here and here, this would be your pillow of air. Okay, so this is just much a much larger space, but you see that, uh, that blue, oh, what did I call it? Like a um, porcelain coating. Now over here, this side, the, so this is your pop-off valve, and he's wiggling around like we're supposed to, so you can begin to see that if um, sediment can get up in there, that's going to foul that out. Okay. And also look on the deck there. You got some little blue flakes so of that porcelain that's fallen off. And uh, here's some of that debris that, uh, that you want to back flush and get out. Okay. Electric heating element, same wattage. And um, so a lot of debris. So when you're back flushing your water heater, this is some of the crap you want to get out of it. Okay. And... Um, so there you have the 12 gallon water heater and um, sliced open. And then we have the six gallon water heater sliced open. And we even went so far as to slice open the uh, burner on that. Okay, 
So let's uh, cover one or two more things, and then we'll be done. Now, when I slice these open and I took all the foam off, a lot of you, your switch is going to fail on you. Now, this is the switch that's the on-off switch down in the bottom left-hand corner. So when you pry those out, this is what the other side's going to look like, okay? And uh, so when you pry those out, you're overcoming those little flag connectors, and you pull those out. Now, it's not a big deal, okay? And you see you do have a little bit of slack here, but not a whole lot of slack, but you should be able to get these out. I would totally turn my power off and pull the switch out, and then you can plug it in and switch it back. Now, another view you have here, let me just pan out a little bit. Remember we talked about how that's a junction box? Okay, and look here. One wire comes into our switch and then leaves our switch, and guess where it goes? Let me turn this a little bit. It's gonna go Looks like it might be a little pinched, but it's going to go to there to that thermostat, okay? And um, it'll make it through the thermostat to the heating element. Again, that's that's all here on the front, okay? So let's see here. Uh, let me hand this back over to Dakota. Okay, folks, um, we're going to stop this video here. We are going to do a little bit more with these water heaters before we totally take them out to the scrapyard. Uh, because I want to show you how to troubleshoot some of the stuff. But now that they're cut open, we can go a little bit deeper. But I think that might be its own standalone video. So from Dakota and Darren, where are we in Joyce, Washington? Happy campers. Happy campers, St. Marver Works. Happy campers, St. Marver Works. So signing off until the next video. Thanks for watching. And if you like this kind of stuff, subscribe to our channel. Share it with your friends. Support us on Patreon. Um, we're going to be coming out with more and more videos. So uh, say goodbye to these water heaters. We're going to scrap these. And we're going to start a whole other video on the front half of these things, following the wires and how to diagnose some of the circuits and things like that. Okay. See you later.